stand and demystify the systems, much less not be a victim to them. And these are the systems that are supposed to help. <laughs> so I often use this as a good visual to see the, this is what, what are we asking her to do? What choices are we asking? What are we asking her to make? And to me, what is the real question is how do we define accessibility? And I'm not just talking about services, but I'm talking about in our organizing work. You know, it is is what what is accessible? Is there accessible and safe spaces like this for advocates to talk about? We can't keep going down this road. What other, what, what other roads can we take to be more proactive about her not falling? into this trap or trying to make some of these systems just a little bit better. So I think about it in terms of accessibility and, in, and inclusiveness. Um, I'm going to give it another example in, in a second, but I just have some thoughts around um, this work and I want to make it closer to home for all of you folks. I can't share the uh, confidential nature of the cases that I am um, seeing, but last year alone I had 88 cases. Um, Melanie is my grad assistant, so she sees women coming in every week. Um, in, into our office. Um, immigrant and international women are particularly vulnerable, not necessarily by age. PhD students, because they have so much at risk, are not going to name it. They are not going to come forward. Um, we're seeing all kinds of different forms of violence against women, um, different kinds of cyber stalking, um, texting, the use of Facebook and MySpace to humiliate women. We're seeing unauthorized um, distribution of, uh, of sex acts. Um, and whether the sex acts were authorized themselves, we don't know. And those are the forms of violence that we're seeing here on campus. And um, I would say that um, women of color and immigrant women are the majority of, of, of our client population. So let me bring it back then to what it is that we're talking about, and I'm going to share one more story because I have only about five more minutes. Um, I have the pleasure of working with an amazing advocate who started doing her um, social justice work when she was about 16 or 17. And it happened, like many of you, purely out of necessity. Um, she is a Hmong woman living in Wisconsin, in rural Wisconsin. And it was during a time when she was a teenager, about 10 years ago, that there was a lot of racial profiling of Hmong teenage boys. And so they were getting arrested um, in large numbers. And community members were coming to her, in particular because she had a little bit more privilege as somebody who traveled more and who um, could speak English better than some of her Hmong sisters. And so she started organizing around state violence by helping young people know what their rights were and giving them cards if they couldn't speak English that they could give to the police and say, I don't speak English, please call so and so. And as a result, she ended up starting her own organization that focused primarily on state violence and also the intersection of that and domestic violence because what happened when you put up your roof is that all the young women and girls start coming to you and saying, I'm being abused, I was raped. Um, and so. I'm really fast forwarding what the, amazing, the amazing work that she's done, but several years ago, in trying to do community building and organizing work, she got so frustrated because it felt like the Hmong community was being so resistant. And the Hmong community is tribal, so there are the leaders, there are male elders that ultimately make the decisions about who, um, you know, what, what the community decides to do. And so her name is Kaju, and she had told me at one point, you know, my new mantra is, you got to meet us halfway. I'm so sick of trying to bring it to you and, and frame it for you and hand it to you in a nice apple pie way. And, and that's not how it really is. you know. And so you need to meet us halfway. And, and, and this resistance was really manifest in the mo their most recent <coughs> double um, murder, uh, murder suicide in which a Hmong man killed his wife and then killed himself. Ultimately, the clans decided that they weren't going to pay for the funeral of the woman because they believed that she was cheating on him. And they would only pay for the funeral of the man. And Kajwa and other young advocates, you know, many of you are, are, are the same age, decided to go to the funeral. It was very risky for them to do this. There was no safety. To confront them, you know, and not to disrespect the actual funeral rite and passage, but to say, you know, this is not okay. You know, so when I think about how structural violence is being resisted, I think about people like Kajua, and I think about what kinds of support does she need in this new generation of the movement. 
And I think some of the questions that we should ask ourselves is, how do we push the violence against women's movement among other social movements? Why do we pit against uh, other social movements? Why is it distinct and separate? How are women's and feminist movements faring in general in social movements? How do we build stronger alliances with those social movements? What concrete things do we need to be doing? One of the things that we women of color in Hawaii are starting to do is looking at reproductive health as a broader umbrella so that we can have allies that we, we think from the human rights and immigrants' rights um, movements that will not betray us. Um, and then, of course, as Jerome has suggested, what is our analysis of global women's and social, uh, social uh, movements? And what are some possible strategies and recommendations for future action? So I'm going to hand it over to Jerome to, to close for us. But what we both really want to do is engage with you in a dialogue about what some of those strategies might look like on the ground. And we have some thoughts for some recommendations for how do we take sort of intersectionality and this, this, this frame further in a way that really supports our movement building rather than hurting our movement building. Round three. <laughs> <laughs> To our, excuse me, our strategy kind of discussion is to kind of really focus on this idea of intersectionality, not just between academics and activists, not just between different sort of groups, movements, and activities, but actually kind of really think <coughs> quite critically. I mean, when we look at this uh, this incredibly Kafka-esque uh, <laughs> diagram here, I mean, this is inter intersectionality. I mean, in ways in, the ways in which sort of state terror in some ways intersects with domestic violence and the ways in which women of color, in, in this instance, immigrant women of color, have to navigate this, this Byzantine kind of system. Mm -hmm. And then, I guess, uh, like Jim said, how do we, coming from our position up here on, on the hill <laughs> in English Manoa, engage both our academic but also our activist work with the local communities in the most effective way? How do we kind of create these intersections and how do we kind of strengthen the kind of ties that we have to one another and, and to various groups in this very kind of critical, very problematic moment, in this moment of financial crisis, but also just kind of, I think, just general kind of social crisis, you know, I think, mm -hmm. I feel. It might just be me because I... No, it's all of us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. but, but I feel that, that I mean, the, the, the economic problem is obviously uh, it's obviously paramount, but the way in which it's impacting us psychologically, you know, it's, it's impacting us psychically, I think is something that we haven't really uh, even begun to delve into, you know, so, so the violence at the, at the very material level, but also the violence at the, at the psychic level. And then how, how thinking about these things can inform what we do to make our activist practice more effective, to make our academic practice more engaged with what really needs to be done. And so, to say, I say all that just to say, uh, we wanted to kind of strategize with all of you to kind of talk about some of these issues and to kind of talk about some of these ideas that we've been putting forward and, you know, what is our next step, those of us who consider ourselves progressive and want to see some kind of uh, positive social change in our society. How do we build these coalitions? How do we keep these coalitions together? Right? I mean, this is the, when I was talking about the third world, right? It was this evanescent moment, right, you know? But it was a moment. And what's important about that moment is the sort of uh, being able to imagine that kind of historical condition of possibility. And I think that's something that we need to get back to, is being able to use, uh, to imagine new coalitions, to imagine new sort of social systems, to imagine new economic systems, to imagine new ways of production that aren't based in the exploitative capitalist model that structures the violence of our society and continue to reproduce that violence on so many of the different levels that we've been talking about. Right. So, that's kind of heavy, but just general. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, just anything, any any comments on, on, on the wealth of speakers that we've had today, just, you know, from the poem, any reactions to that, to um, some of these really, really lofty concepts, so we don't need, like, solutions, but we kind of just want to hear the voices. Like, what were just some thoughts?